Let's give him a good praise this morning. Can we do that? Amen. Amen. I'm overwhelmed a lot of times. Uh, I, I'd like to say it's always by the mercy, the grace, and the presence of God. But recently, I think we've just been overwhelmed. And uh, as we're overwhelmed, we need to remember who we serve, who lives in us, what we possess, where we're going. And uh, I tell you, I just take a moment this morning to praise and worship God for His goodness and His provision in our lives. Great to see you guys out here this morning. Thank you for coming out. We're gaining a little more, a little more each Sunday. Thank you for joining us online. So glad that you're with us online today. Looking forward to the time we can come back together and things be a little more normal. But for right now, I'm just praising God that we can get together at all and that we can hang out, we can worship the Lord, and we can break open the Word of God. I thank the Lord for that this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. We want to set our agreement with yours, as Matthew 18 and 19 says, that any two of you agreeing is touching anything that's done of our Father that's in heaven. When we do that, uh, if we're not in agreement, I, I don't think it carries the effect that it's supposed to. We have to align our hearts, our wills, and our emotions with what the Word of God says. And that means a lot of times we're going to stand against the situation. We're going to stand against the circumstance. We're going to stand against the challenge. We're, we're going to believe what, what we read over what we see with these. We're, we're going to profess and confess the Word of God into these situations. And, and we go into this not wondering and hoping, will God hear our, our, our prayers? We, we go into this knowing because the Word of God says that, that every Every promise is yes, and we add the amen to it. We add the so be it to it. So I'm not wondering if God does. I'm already believing He does. I'm going to thank Him and praise Him because it's a done deal today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, we know that our, our city, our, our county, our country, our world needs our prayers desperately. In this time, in this situation, we hold them up in prayer. Right now, we have business owners not here this morning because they're kind of hanging around their businesses today with the situation that's be taking place in Clarksville. Let's be praying everything remains peaceful and everything goes well. Let's be praying that, that voices are heard. Amen? That voices are heard, that, that people's hearts are changed. That's what needs to happen is a change of heart. So let's be praying everyone safe and sound today. I know you've got stuff going on, things that are happening. If you've got a need or a challenge or situation in your life, would you do me a favor and stick a hand up for just a moment? And we're going to look around and we're going to pick somebody out. We're going to agree in prayer with them right now. Father, we come before you. So thankful, Lord, for this day, praising you, Lord, for this opportunity to be together in your house. Father, we're the church wherever we are, but we're assembled today as your body. And that means we're on business for you, Lord. Father, we pray one for another today. Every need, situation, and circumstance. We're believing, Lord, that you're ministering. You're ministering provision, peace, knowledge, guidance, wisdom, whatever's needed. We pray today, Lord, that you would minister in hearts and in lives and make a difference. I pray, Lord, that you would change the things that need to be changed in me. I pray, Lord, that you would start with me, Lord, and minister your way out from here. Father, touching your people, encouraging them, and blessing them. Father, whatever arena, whatever the need, I praise you that you're the payment for it all. Father, we agree on these things, and Father, we receive these things now. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you guys say amen? And let's sing just a little bit more of that song this morning. You No one more beautiful. You are beautiful, God. You are the most beautiful. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. Oh, God. There is no one more wonderful. You are
Amen. Tell the praise and worship team, thank you so much. Would you do that? Amen. Good job, guys. I, I appreciate you. You can be seated. I, I appreciate them and their hard work. You know, when the, when the weirdness erupted, uh, they didn't change. Uh, they still get together and they, and they practice and they pray and they work and they prepare. And uh, they didn't slack off one bit. I want to say thanks to Seth. Seth has been working diligently. If these things quit or blank out, don't freak out on us. We have had such technical issues since this began, and, and we've upgraded some things uh, for being online, some cameras and, and different things. And, and I'm telling you, our, our computer program doesn't like it. It has been going crazy. And Seth has been working on this just about every day since this stuff started. And I appreciate his diligence and doing his best and getting this stuff working. I appreciate it very, very much. I got something. I got a gift today, and it's, uh, it's way cool. It's way, I know you're going to be jealous, and I know you're going to want one. What do you think? I need, I need an honest opinion. You like it? Wow, guys, that's pretty weak. Here, let me help you with it. Uh, uh, I, 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 I am the... You know, I, I had one of these. I had one of these when Kay and I first started dating in 1978. Except it wasn't just a foo man, it was a chew, a foo man chew. I had the strip down the middle too. So uh, Kay has asked me many times to grow it back, have you not? <laughs> wow. Wow. Because it was, it was really, I mean, it's, it's ultra sexy, isn't it? When she would smooch me, she would grab one by each side and, and, just, really, and just really give me a smooch. And I do kind of miss that. And uh, I may grow that back. I mean, uh, there's a whole, there was a whole bunch of us back here got our picture made because we have the cool mask uh, contest still going on. And I'm keeping track of everybody's cool mask. Now, this one's pretty cool right here. I like it. I like it a whole bunch. Thank you for the gift. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate you being here. And, I, and at this point in our series, the series entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? My question is this morning, where, where do we go from here? Where, where do we go from here? Have we strayed from our original thought and intent concerning this series? And it may seem like it, but no, we're really still on track. We haven't strayed one little bit. Uh, we, we have taken a little, a little sidebar study for a reason that I'll share with you in a minute. But let's kind of recenter this morning, get our minds uh, back where they need to be. Let's bring up John 14, verses 1 through 6 this morning, because this is one of our foundational scriptures. This is where we started, where Jesus came to his disciples and he told them, your heart must not be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. Remember, remember, remember. It's in the imperative. He's, he's not making it a choice, although it's our choice. What he's telling them is your heart cannot be troubled. If you don't want to lose your mind, if you don't want to go crazy, you need to understand your heart must not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now look at these next verses because they're very important. He says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not, I wouldn't have told you. He said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. Verse 3 says, and if I go away and prepare that place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Now we're going farther this morning. Verse 4 says, you know the way where I am going. You know the way where I'm going. He said, I'm going I'm going away, and you know the way where I'm going. Verse 5 says, Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? How can we know the way? Do you see the fear? Can you sense the, the anxiety in his voice? What are you talking about? Let's set, the, let's set the scene again. Let's grab context again because they're sitting at the Passover. They're sitting at what we call the Last Supper. They're sitting around celebrating the Passover. Jesus has been teaching them all the way to this point, and now he teaches them, I'm about to go away. They're going to kill me. He's just a few hours from his crucifixion. He's telling them, I'm going away, and they're losing their mind because you can see in Thomas's question, he's going, where do we go from here? 
What, what do you mean you're going away? We have followed you three and a half years. We believe you're Messiah. We're ready to walk with you. We're ready to go to battle with you, to overthrow the Roman government, whatever you got in mind. And now you're telling us you're going away. And Jesus said, I'm going away, and you know the way I'm going. And Thomas is saying, no, we don't. We don't know where you're going. We don't understand what you're doing. We don't get this at all. And they're terrified of what's going to happen happen next. Does that sound familiar? Let's go to verse 6 and finish off this thought. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now again, if you read that, you almost forget the first verse because you're, you're immediately, your mind is attracted to the rest of what Jesus is teaching. It's almost like he had a sentence and then he changed the thought process, but he didn't. If you'll read this together as it's supposed to be read, you're, you're going to see the continuity of thought. He didn't say, he didn't say your heart must not be troubled. Now let me tell you something different. This was one in the same thought. He's teaching them the way to walk above anxiety and fear and stress in our hearts. See, here's our double-edged intent. In the midst of our present crisis, the world in upheaval, a disruption as I've never known. I've been through some disruptions, but this one is crazy. A disruption like we have never seen. Where do we go from here? And how do we deal with the stress and the fear and the anxiety that's associated with this time as we try to figure out what's going on. Well, we found direction. We found direction here in John 14, and we found direction in Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus is telling the parable of a, a sower goes out to sow. And as he goes out to sow, some of the seed falls on good ground and bad ground and hard ground. And he tells us that the Word is the seed. The Word of God is the seed. And then he begins to tell us how important it is that we understand, that we understand the Word of God. You've got to plant the Word of God in the soil of your heart. Because if you don't, what happens? He tells us in Matthew 13, the evil one comes and snatches away the seed before it can produce, before it can produce, before the Word of God can do something in our lives. And what do we need? We need peace. Amen? We need peace. We need joy. We need to remain calm. We need to walk in faith. We have all these needs. All these needs that we need are, are fruits of the Spirit and they're not gifts. And fruits have to be produced. So that means that the right seed has to be planted. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Now, wait a minute, Don. I thought... In the beginning, if I remember right, Don, this was a series about heaven. It is. But we've been preparing the ground, our hearts. We've been preparing our hearts to receive our seeds of destiny. We've been preparing the ground to receive what we need. And we finished last Sunday with our preparation by asking the Holy Spirit. Last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. And we've asked the Holy Spirit to water the ground with understanding. Lord, we, he, he taught us in this, same, in this same chapter of John 14 that the Holy Spirit would come not just to bring us power, but to be our guide, to be our strength to be our friend, to be our comforter, to be our teacher. He said, you've you got to understand that the Holy Spirit is going to water the seeds of the ground and going to make a difference in your life by what the Word of God produces. Destiny. Destiny. Destiny is defined as someone's future regarded as preordained. Someone's future regarded as preordained. Now, unless you're, unless depending on your theology, that when I say the word preordained, you may freak out or you may see it as a source of comfort. I don't know where you're coming from, but let me tell you something. If you've been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're, you, you've got a future that is preordained. 
You've got some things that are set in place. The Word of God says very plainly that it is preordained that we be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That He's going to be working in our lives through His seed, the Word of God, to make me more like Jesus while I'm on this earth. And then after I leave this earth, I will be made just like Jesus in that place that is set as my destiny in the future. That, that's what we have to remember. Now, Now, wait a minute, Don. I need peace and I need hope for the here and now. Jesus and Paul both have taught us to have peace and hope and joy in the here and now. You, you, you've got to fix your minds on the then. If you want the peace and hope and joy you need now, you've got to fix your minds. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, I will return and I will receive you unto myself. And you will be with me. He said, if you want to walk in some peace and hope and joy, you've got to get your mind off everything that's around you and surrounding you in this moment and you've got to fix your mind on some heavenly hope you've got to start looking ahead one of my favorite authors and preachers A.W. Tozier said the church is constantly being tempted to accept this world as her home but if she is wise she will consider that she stands in the valley between the mountain peaks of eternity past and eternity to come we do well to think of the long tomorrow we do well to think of the long, we do well to, to, to view the circumstance we find ourselves in and the mess that's going on around us in the context of the seed, the Word of God. As I mentioned last Sunday, we all want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. We want everything to be perfect up to the moment that the Lord returns to, to carry His church away home. That that's not what the Word of God says is going to happen. We're living in probably the most exciting times of church history since the first century as we see things about us and around us fulfilling Scripture and prophecy and telling us to look up that our redemption is getting closer and closer and closer. Amen. I don't want to go through hard times. Don't want my kids to. Don't want my grandkids to. But the Word of God says it's going to get darker and darker as it gets brighter and brighter in us. And He gets closer and closer to His return. It's not going to be a cakewalk. So instead of losing our minds and running around in circles like those who have no hope, the Word of God says, we need to be standing strong. We need to be standing tall, ready with the answers to people that come to us and say, where do we go from here? What's going on? The Word of God says we need to be ready to give that answer of hope to every man that inquires of us who Jesus is and what He means in our lives. Amen. We can't go through this like the world. So far from being a source of morbid grief, our thoughts of heaven are, produ are to produce in us calm in the midst of the storm. Calm in the midst of the storm. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 18, Therefore, comfort or encourage or reassure one another with these words. Jesus said, your heart must not be troubled. Your heart cannot be troubled. So where, where we do go from here has everything to do with where we go from here. In our first installment, I ask a question. I need a one-word response. You guys at home watching online, grab your phones. You guys here, I need a one-word response. I'm going to ask you again. What comes to your mind, one word, when I say the word heaven. When I say heaven, what comes into your mind? What is that one word response? In the first four installments, I've planted a few seeds along the way, and I'm wondering if any of them have taken any root. In part three, I mentioned the present heaven in theology called the intermediate state where we go when we die. 
The moment that our heart quits beating, the Word of God says, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. That has always been such a hope and such a source of peace to me. There's, there's no lag time. There's no downtime. I'm not waiting in line. Amen. I'm not waiting in line. I mean, the moment my heart quits beating here, the last exhale here is the next inhale in His presence. To be standing in front of the one that all together loves me. The one who knows me as I am, accepted me like I was, and loves me in the here and now. That I stand in his presence. That I, that I will see him someday. That's called present heaven or the intermediate. Why is it called intermediate state if it's for eternity? Well, heaven is for eternity and it is internal, eternal, but our destiny includes living in resurrected bodies just like Jesus. When we get to, when we get to heaven, we'll not, we'll not see Jesus the Spirit. We'll see Jesus the resurrected man. When we get there, he'll be in that resurrected body. And someday we will receive a resurrected body. And we will live with him on a resurrected earth and a resurrected heaven. Revelations 21 and 22. When we die, we go to the present heaven, awaiting that great resurrection day when we're reunited. You, you wouldn't believe how many people have come to me and said, I thought when we die, our spirit goes to heaven. Yes, that's what it says. I thought when we die, we end up in heaven. Yes, that's what it says. Then what's up with the resurrection? That's when that spirit is reunited with wherever you are in the grave or wherever you have fallen. God keeps track of everybody everywhere all the time. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground he doesn't know about. I, I've had people tell me, my, I, lost, I lost a husband, I lost a son, a wife in action in the military. They have no idea where he's at. Can I tell you God knows right where they at? Can I tell you it's okay? He's got it all under control. And on that resurrection day, our spirit will be reunited with our body that prepares us to inhabit that final destination. Don, that's just... That's just strange. It's really not. Heaven is a created place created by the eternal God and creator. Don't be amazed that he's still creating. He's still creating. What did Jesus say? I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going, I'm getting it ready. To pre Could he not just say it and it would be? Yeah, it would, wouldn't it? Because that's what he did when he created everything. But I think that that place that we end up is so special. I think that it, that, that it is so beyond our imaginations and our capabilities to, to try to ramp our hearts around. I believe that, that the Lord himself has busied himself with preparing that bridal chamber for his bride, waiting for us to get there. He said, I'm going to prepare a place myself. God chose to dwell there in the place we call heaven. He, he doesn't have to dwell there. He doesn't need a dwelling place. He's God. He, he's God. It's not a challenge for the all-powerful God to dwell in a spiritual or physical dimension. He's God. The real question is, as humans, as humans, being both physical and spiritual, can we dwell in a place without physical properties? Could we? And if we didn't have physical properties, would we be a human? If we didn't have something like we're trapped in today, what would we be? Do you remember that God first created the body to be a dwelling place for the spirit that he breathed in? That he first made us and formed us out of the dirt of the ground. And he breathed that living breath of life into us. And the word of God says that man became a living soul. He made first the receptacle of the spirit. This physical body stuff has to be important somehow. He raised, he raised Jesus, the first fruits, the prototype of those coming back from the dead physically. He raised him physically. He didn't leave that body in the tomb. He could have raised him spiritually and left the body behind. But what was the, what was the convincer? 
When, when John and Pete were running, <laughs> they were running to the tomb. You've read it, right? It was that resurrection morning, and, and, and John being younger, it says in the King James, did outrun Peter. He outran Pete to the tomb. And when he got to the tomb, he was looking in. Read the account when you get home. He was looking in. If you look at that word, look, it means that he was just surveying the situation. But when Pete got there, Pete, one of my New Testament heroes, because he's Pete, he just comes busting up in a place. He don't stop at the door. He doesn't tap John on the shoulder and say, what you seeing? He knocks John out of the way and goes barreling into this empty tomb. And he's looking around going, what's up with this? What is going on? And it says, then John followed him in. And then he's looking, and the word for looking is, you'll never guess, he's beginning to understand understanding is beginning to come to him. Those scriptures that Jesus taught, those words that he used that are spirit and life are starting to take root in John's heart. Do you know why? Because what was left of what they had wrapped Jesus up in was laying in that tomb like a cocoon. It wasn't busted open. It wasn't tore open. <laughs> they would wrap you up in these individual strips and when it started to set, it was like a cast. You could kneel on it and it wouldn't break. When Jesus was resurrected bodily and physically, he got up out that and didn't disrupt anything. The Word of God says the napkin that was laid over his face was folded up neatly and placed over in the corner. Why? Well, if we were Jews, we'd know, wouldn't we? Because if you invite me over to eat, and I hope pretty soon you can, and all this will pass, and you'll start feeding me again, because as you can see, I'm wasting away to nothing. Hey Amen. I'm just about, I'm just skin and bone up here, just barely hanging on. And, and I come over to your house, and I would eat, and we were Jewish, and I would just eat and eat and eat, and I got ready to leave. If I got up and I took my napkin and wiped my face, and I crumbled it up, and I threw it over in the corner, it meant that meal was delicious. Invite me back any time. But if I got up and I neatly folded it, and I set it neatly by my plate and my utensils, it meant you're not a very good cook. Please don't ask me back anymore. Did you know that? Did you know that? And that way you didn't have to hurt anybody's feelings by saying, boy, that wasn't very good. You, you, you told them, you conveyed what was going on through that napkin. When Jesus got up, he folded that napkin up and laid it down. He said, I done it. I handled it and I conquered it. I ain't doing this no more. Don't ask me to come back this way again. When he comes back next time, it's going to be different. Amen. Amen. Why did he resurrect him physically? Why not just spiritually? Because it was the seal of the deal when he, reckoned, when, it, when he resurrected him physically from the dead, when he got up. So, so bear with me. Our, our final destination will have physical properties to it. Perhaps we can begin to imagine that our present heaven does too. Maybe it's got some physical properties properties to it. What if heaven is the substance and earth is the shadow? What, what if in Hebrews Paul is describing the heavenly priesthood of Jesus and he's using the original tabernacle as his example and look what he says. Let, let's bring up Hebrews 8 and 5. Hebrews 8 and 5. It says, these serve as what? a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle, for he said, be careful that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. He said, you're making these things and they are a copy. They are a pattern. You're building the tabernacle. You're building the temple. And it's only a shadow of something that already exists there, 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 there is a tabernacle in heaven. There, 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 is, there is a worship central in heaven. 
and it is there waiting on us. When Jesus arose and went to heaven, he presented his own blood in the holy of holies of heaven for the forgiveness of my sins. That's why I'm totally and completely forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not the blood of bulls and goats that can never take away sin. It's the blood of Jesus himself that forgives us of every sin. Revelations 15 and 8 tells us the heavenly sanctuary was filled with smoke from God's glory. Well, is that real smoke or is it figurative? We're told of scrolls in heaven, elders who have faces, martyrs who wear clothes, people with palm branches in their hands. There's music in heaven, uh, Pastor Jason. I, I think going to be the coolest part about heaven. There's going to be music up in heaven. We are going to be jamming like lunatics. We're going to worship and never get tired, never bust a sweat. We are going to be crazy with worship in heaven. You know what that implies? Voices. There's going to be voices in heaven. And then I read of horses. Horses coming. I don't even like horses. Horses coming. You like horses? I don't like horses. You know why? Because I grew up around horses and every stinking horse we had, especially ponies, were demon possessed. Somebody say amen. And they were always trying to kill me. They were running my legs down fences, running me under, under trees, dragging me across. Good Lord, I just don't like horses because they're demon-possessed. I hope Sister Pat is watching. Maybe Snowball will be there. I don't know. I was preaching one day on heaven. Boy, I was ultra-spiritual. And I was preaching on one day on heaven, and I was preaching heaven. I said, don't be looking for your dog to be in heaven. Jesus didn't die for no dog. Boy, I mean, I was really hammering on it. And I was getting after it, and Sister Pat used to sit right over here, and she raised her hand. I said, what? She, she stopped me. I said, what? She said, Snowball's going to be in heaven. Snowball was her little demon-possessed chihuahua. That thing is psycho. That dog was a psycho head. Every time I went around there, we'd go to visit. Snowball would try to chew my leg off. He was just, if there is a heaven and hell for dogs, I'm going to tell you something. Anyway, anyway, she said, Snowball's going to be there. And I said, Sister, I'll never forget. I said, Sister Pat, I said, you know that old saying, don't you? She said, what? I said, ain't got a snowball's chance in. And she said, you stop right there. You stop right there. If I end up where I'm going and Snowball is there, I may have taken a wrong turn. Amen. <laughs> but maybe Snowball will be there. I've had so much fun digging into heaven, I can't even tell you. Let's bring up Hebrews 9 and 24. Hebrews 9 and 24. You know, Hebrews seems to indicate that heaven... Heaven is the source and earth is a derivative. Instead of thinking of heaven and earth as total opposites, perhaps they could be some kind of interlinking dimensions. It says, for the Messiah did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, only a model of the true one. There it is again. But into heaven itself, that he might now appear in the presence of God for us. The word of God says he's seated at the right hand of God. Is he really seated? Is he, does God have a hand? I think he does. I'm made in his image. I got him. That's cool, Don, but what does it matter? Paul said in Colossians 3, 1 through 3, set your hearts and your minds on things above, which is the process of peace in this present world. Getting more familiar with our destiny produces a familiarity with our present peace. Were you ever required to read Paradise Lost? If we ever required to read that, that classic by John Milton, wouldn't it be a source of hope to know that paradise has been found? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it provide you with some kind of peace to know that paradise never was, never was lost? I'm in Luke 23, starting in verse 39. It says, Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God since you're undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because 
we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this, this man's done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned to him in that moment and said, you know it. Today you'll be with me where? In paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. The Matthew account of this same time says that even the criminals crucified with him were taunting him. Matthew 27 and 44. They were both taunting him. Now all of a sudden one of them turns to him. What changed his heart? What made the difference? What turned him from a blasphemer to a believer? He was hanging on that cross. He's talking smack to Jesus just like the other one is. And in the middle of it he turns and he says, Remember me. I'm going to tell you what it was. It was that other worldly presence in the middle of that stressful horrible situation. It was Jesus himself as he introduced the hope of heaven into that situation. It was Jesus himself that brought it to bear in that situation. I just can't believe I would have had the presence of mine, the presence of mine to include someone with me heading to paradise, but Jesus did. His very presence made a difference in that man's situation. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That word paradise means a walled park, enclosed garden. It means nature under man's dominion. Put that thought together. What does it take to have a beautiful garden or a beautiful park? Ask Leon, he'll tell you. It takes some work. It takes thought. It takes effort. Heaven is a place of indescribable beauty because it's a place of indescribable order. <laughs> that may not mean anything to anybody but me. But boy, does that bless me. When I get there, everything will be in order. Nothing will ever be messed up. Nothing will ever need cleaning. You'll never have to mow in heaven. <laughs> Man, there, I got an amen. <laughs> You won't be out there 105 degrees with your weed eater. Purr, purr, purr. Praying over it that it might start. <laughs> Man, I'm having fun. I'm sorry. I, I just never dug into heaven like this. God says in Revelation 2 and 7, to the overcomer will be given the right to eat from the tree of life, that same physical tree that was in Eden, Genesis 3 and 24, and will be in the new Jerusalem is now in heaven. How can we eat if we can't eat? We'll be, we'll be eating in heaven. Some form of physicality must exist with our intermediate bodies in the present heaven before we even receive our resurrected bodies. No wonder we're encouraged to think on these things. After man fell in the garden, Adam and Eve, the garden wasn't destroyed but their ability to be there was. You remember? He didn't wipe out the garden. He just said, you can't come. And he placed angels there. Genesis 3 and 24. It appears to have remained just as it was, a physical paradise removed to a realm or a dimension to which we don't have access now. Maybe it was moved to the present heaven. I don't know. I guess I want to ask you this question. Would you like to have access to paradise found? Would you like to have access to paradise found? Went to two funerals this week. Both of them outdoors. Both of them celebrations. Both of them sad. Went to a funeral of a little eight-year-old boy. A lot of y'all knew Owen. It was a great celebration of Owen. And I sat there thinking. I was already working on this message, and I sat there thinking, what's wrong with having baseball in heaven? <laughs> How's it home if you've never been there? Not only does God change your destiny, He changes your origin. When you receive Him as Christ, heaven becomes your home. 
everything will be familiar. Why won't there be creeks to play in? Why can't a boy go fishing? I'm changing my mind. I'm changing my mind. I'm closer to there than I am here. I need to get a grasp on where I'm headed. Amen? Then it was an elderly lady, loved and respected in this community, served God all of her life. She had lived a long time to a ripe old age. <laughs> had taken care of her husband and his sickness. Wow. She liked 4 age. She loved 4 age. Why can't you have a calf in heaven? I don't know. What's wrong with that? Here's, I'm not sure everything's there, but I do know the way. I do know the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father but through me. So I have to ask, do you know Christ as your Savior? And if you don't, you need to receive Him right now. If you're online watching and you're saying, I don't know about this, you need to receive Christ as your Savior. He made it simple that we can even understand. Father, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and into my life. Be my Savior and my Messiah. Forgive me of every wrong and set my destination now. Jesus, I'll serve you the rest of of my life bring peace and joy and hope in Jesus name we pray amen